Well, I guess I can just start. The clock is 12.30 here in uh, Oslo. So uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Axactor presentation. My name is Jonas Lien. I work as a research analyst at uh, ABG Sundal College. <coughs> Uh, both on uh, the equity and, uh, and credit side. So I've been following this uh, this company and uh, the debt collection industry for some three years now. Uh, and we are lucky enough to, today to have uh, the CEO of uh, Axactor, Johnny Solis, with us today. Uh, so with that, I think I'll just hand the word over to, to Johnny. So the floor is yours, uh, guys. Thank you very much, Jonas, and uh, good afternoon and welcome to this Saksaktor company presentation. For those of you that uh, doesn't know us that well, I would uh, like to start by giving a short introduction to the company. Um, then I will give a few highlights from our Q4 presentation, which we announced just a couple of weeks ago. And after that, I will briefly describe the transaction we announced in December, which we, uh, where we basically refinanced the total balance sheet. Uh, and I will also give a teaser of our strategy update that we performed in the second half of last year. And then we round it off with an outlook summary. And also we will make sure to have time for a Q&A session. So if we could uh, please move on to slide three for a short introduction of Axactor. Axactor was established in late 2015 and we have a headquarter in Oslo. Our main focus in, is on collection and acquisition of non-performing loans from financial institutions. So we are both buying non-performing loans and we do collection on non-performing loans on behalf of third-party clients. We operate in six European countries, uh, Spain, Germany, Italy, Norway, Sweden and Finland. And currently we are just about uh, 1,100 uh, FTEs. We have been one of the largest NPL unsecured debt purchasers in Europe over the last few years. And we have done portfolio acquisitions uh, north of 600 million euros for 2019 and 2020 combined. The company is listed as uh, Oslo Stock Exchange and our main shareholder, Geveran, owns just uh, north of 40% of the company. If we could please move to the next slide for more details on our strategic positioning. So when we started Axactor back in 2015, we had a clear idea regarding our strategic positioning. In brief, it was cost leadership. That was a clear strategic target. We carefully selected the six markets where we believed to have the best risk reward. And main focus were on fresh business to consumer unsecured debt with the bank and finance segment, within the bank and finance segments. The approach was almost just a simple acquisition of a relatively small platform uh, company as bridged into a new market. Uh, we immediately replaced main systems and processes to the unified Vonax Actor platform. And we used our strong balance sheet to scale the business organically in both NPLs and 3PC. Uh, and as you can see here on the, on the right side uh, of this slide, the result when it comes to the cost position has been satisfying. Here it is important to focus on the trend as we obviously have higher cost to collect versus income the first years of operations due to scale disadvantages. Uh, and we expect the ratio to continue to go down over time as we continue to gain more scale effects. And we consider our cost position to be one of our key competitive advantages also in the, in the future. Uh, if we could please move to slide six for some uh, key financial highlights. If we look at the main financial figures, they were in line with our expectations for the quarter. For Q4, we delivered 95 million euros of gross revenue, a total income of 58 million, cash EBITDA of 64, and a reported EBITDA of 21 million. The annualized return on equity to shareholders were 4%. Even though 2020 was a very challenging year, we still managed to deliver a gross revenue close to 330 million euros and a total income of uh, above 200 million euros. Cash EBITDA also about 200 million, 213. The reported EBITDA was obviously highly affected by portfolio revaluations uh, done in Q1 and Q4 and ended up at 36 million. The return on equity to shareholders ended uh, unfortunately in negative territory for the year at minus 5%. Let's move on to the next slide where we look closer at the gross revenue development per business segment. All our business segment had a positive gross revenue development in Q4 compared to last quarter. If we look at the three segments, starting with NPL, we did achieve a gross revenue of 69 million euros. 
This was mainly a result of normalization towards pre-pandemic levels. And we did invest north of 200 million euros in new portfolios during the year. In other words, we are still in investment mode with increasing book values on portfolios, although at a lower level than previous years. For third-party collection, or TPC as we also call it, the gross revenue increased substantially from Q3, up from 11 to 14 million euros. But unfortunately, we are not back at pre-pandemic levels yet. We have experienced that closing of new 3PC contract has taken longer time than what we consider normal, as some customers are postponing the decision regarding new collection partners. Other customers have been holding back on volumes sent to collection, but we now see that these effects are diminishing, and we expect 3PC volumes to pick up during 2021 and onwards. For our runoff segment reels, the sales came in at 12 million euros, which was a positive surprise in our, in our view. The trend from Q3 continued with higher volumes at better prices than anticipated. However, Rios is only counting for a small part of our balance sheet, some 3% of the total book value exposure on portfolios. On the next slide, we can see that the positive gross revenue trend is also translating into margin expansion. In this graph, we focus on our core business segments, NPL and third-party collection. Hence, the Rio figures are excluded in the illustration. The gross revenue for the business areas increased by 7% combined for Q4 2020 compared to same quarter last year. Even more interesting is the development in personal expenses. For the same comparison period, the personal expenses are down to one, uh, close to 1.5 million euros or 9%. This is crucial for Axactor as one of our main strategic goals is to be industry leading on cost to collect and personnel costs are a significant part of that equation. Operating expenses are also down, but only a moderate 1%. In Exacto, we are constantly focusing on our cost position, and we expect to be able to push for further margin expansion going forward. Let's now look a bit more into detail on each of the business segments, starting with NPL on the next slide. As you have already seen, the NPL collections has continued to normalize. For Q4, the contribution margin is down 10% uh, points compared to Q3 from 78 to 68 percent. But here it is important to note that the regular amortization level is back to a normalized level of 40 percent for the quarter compared to 34 percent in Q3. Furthermore, Axactor did take a negative revaluation on the NPL book of 8.9 million euros in Q4, which takes the total income down to 33 million. As some of you uh, maybe know, we also did a negative revaluation of the NPL book of 27 million euros in Q2 last year. And we commented that we assume curves to be back at pre-COVID levels from the start of this year. This last negative revelation is primarily a result of us not being entirely back at that levels, as we did anticipate when we set the new curves in June last year. Hence, we have now also adjusted the curves for 2021 and the second half of 2022 through the 8.9 million revaluation. We obviously regret the latest revelation, but the fact is that the pandemic situation has lasted longer than what we assumed when we revised the curves in the second quarter of last year. On the next page, we will give more details on which assumptions we are taking regarding the collection curves going forward. As you can see from the graph, our cash collected did not meet our active forecast for the fourth quarter, which is shown as the difference between the blue bar marked as Q4 and the green curve line. Our new active forecast, being the curves presented after the negative revaluation of 8.9 million, are now aligned with current performance and is shown as the orange curve line. There are different ways of implementing curve adjustments. Oxactor takes a prudent approach. And accounting-wise, we are assuming historical underperformance as lost. This is a more conservative approach than the one assuming that all or parts of the underperformance can be recaptured in the future. However, it is worth mentioning that this does not necessarily mean that the collections are actually lost, as there are not made any adjustments to the claim against the debtors, and the debt can still be partly or fully repaid. Now please turn to the next slide for more in-depth comments on the 3PC development. As already mentioned, the 3PC revenue reached 14 million euros for the quarter, showing that the recapture after the first COVID wave is, is well underway. However, the business segment is still burdened by the pandemic as we are down 11% year over year. On the positive note, we are recording the highest contribution margin since the second quarter 2019 of 44%.
The margin expansion is primarily driven by cost reductions, and over time, we also expect scale effects to be a positive contributor to further margin expansions for the segment. Let's move to the next slide for more details on our runoff segment uh, Rios. For those of you that don't know us that well from before, Rios stands for Real Estate Old Assets and relates to a few but large portfolios we did in Spain back in 2018 and 19. Uh, in a nutshell, these are small apartments and some commercial properties that uh, for the most cases are ready to sell um, for, uh, to end users. And uh, just to underline, Axacto will not invest in new Rio portfolios and this is considered a non-core area for us. We are now in the tail of the portfolio. You have already seen the Rio financial performance for the quarter, so I will not repeat that. But um, as you probably remember, Axacto did an impairment accrual of 27 million euros in the first half of 2020. This was based on the prices and sales volumes that we experienced at the time. In Q3, we released approximately 5 million of this accrual due to higher sales volumes and better prices than first anticipated. Uh, external valuation has been conducted during second half of 2020, and they support a higher valuation than what we used in our accrual uh, calculations. This, further, this is further backed by the prices and volumes we have seen over the last two quarters. So uh, based on this, we did book a final impairment of 16 million euros for 2020, and hence uh, we released another 6 million of the initial accrual done in the first half of last year. The fully consolidated book value at year end was 79 million euros, and Axacto's exposure is approximately 40% of this amount due to minority interests in the structure. On the next slide, we will present more details on the reported financials. If we start with the total income, it was obviously burdened with the 8.9 million negative revaluation on NPL, ending up at 58 million euros for the quarter. The reported EBTA margin came in at 36%, also burdened with the same negative revelation. But the 5.9 million accrual release on Rios pulls the EBTA in the opposite direction. Cash EBTA came in at 64 million for the quarter. And I think given the pandemic situation, these are pretty robust figures, especially on cash EBTA. So in the interest of time, I would like that we skip slide 14 and move directly to page 16, where I will briefly go through uh, main elements of our balance sheet restructuring that we have just uh, finalized. As many of you are probably aware of, in December 2020, we announced a major multi-step financial transaction to improve our competitive position. The transaction consisted of the uh, following main elements, total equity issue of 50 million euros, refinancing of unsecured bond and RCF facilities, and roll up of Axacto Invest and refinancing of the loans in that vehicle as well. The main motivation for the transaction was to simplify the structure, extend the maturity on our credit lines, and increase investment capacity. We obviously also wanted to reduce our funding costs, and this was achieved through better terms and improved structure on the RCF facility. The roll up of the SPV triggered a mandatory offer from Geveran for 100% of the shares in Axacto. This transaction is now finalized and Geveran ended up at 40.6% ownership after receiving very few shares in the mandatory offer as, uh, as anticipated. The offer was also not recommended by the board of directors in Axator. On the next slide, we can see more details on our new uh, debt maturity profile. Um, I think, um, uh, as you know, as uh, all, all the major credit facilities were refinanced and maturities extended. Um, the RCFs in Axactor and Axactor Invest was uh, merged into one credit facility of 620 million euros, with the 75 million being an accordion option. Uh, and the result is that we have no major maturities of any significance until January 24. Uh, on the next slide, you can see on slide 18, you can see more details on pro forma balance sheet effects from the transaction. But uh, again, however, I would like us to, in the interest of time, skip this slide and move directly to slide 20. Uh, for more details on the strategic update uh, that we did the second half of uh, last year. Even though Axactor has revised the strategy, you will recognize most of the elements from before. For us, strategy is simply explaining the tool for us to decide where and how to compete. The, the three pillars in our strategy remains unchanged, but we are doing certain adjustments to meet them in a better way. And I will give you a short recap of the three. 
So first one, uh, Axactor shall focus on bank and finance sector. We would like to be the preferred partner for banks and financial institutions when it comes to collection services and sale of non-performing loans. Secondly, we shall pursue profitable organic growth and exploit economies of scale. And finally, we are using the concept One Exactor, where we emphasize on building the best collection platform in the industry. And key elements are how to take maximum advantage of the already standardized IT systems and infrastructure that all our countries are operating on, cross-country collaboration and, and competent sharing. If we can move to the next slide, please, we will give some more flavor on how to pursue this uh, profitable, profitable growth. There are, of course, several ways to approach this uh, target. When we have evaluated what is important for Axactor, the idea of maximizing the risk reward has been key. So when we have concluded on where to compete, it has always been with the risk reward thinking as a foundation. That is also the reasoning behind our geographical presence. We have chosen the countries that we believe will give the best risk reward over time. All the countries has well-functioning legal systems, large volumes of NPL transactions, and the customers are also outsourcing 3PC volumes at a decent margin in our core segments. This is why we believe that Axactor should target organic growth in existing markets. We still need to increase scale in several of our countries to further reduce our cost to collect, and we don't see any other markets in Europe that could offer more attractive opportunities than what we see in our current markets. Axactor will obviously focus on purchasing of non-performing loans, but at the same time, we need to capitalize more on our high-quality debt collection platform. This means more focus on 3PC and capitalized business. This will increase volume and bring our contribution margin up over time. This is also why we are putting more efforts into partnerships, where we both service and buy claims from a few banks in every market. Finally, we will strengthen our focus on the bank finance segment. Previously, we have had a broader target in our 3PC sales efforts, but going forward, the focus will be on bank finance in addition to medium and large accounts in SME space where the profitability is attractive. Furthermore, we will uh, focus on business to consumer unsecured and have less focused on secured portfolios. Already today, secured MPLs are a very small part of Axactor's balance sheet. As you can see, if we move to the next slide, slide 22. So to continue at the same note, 95%, no, sorry, 94% of Axactor's portfolio book value exposure is within our strategic core unsecured non-performing loans. The vast majority of these unsecured loans are related to business to consumers. The remaining 6% is equally split between NPL uh, secured and REALs. The 48 million euros uh, nominated as non axactor exposure is related to minority interest in the real structure. If we turn to the next slide, we will show a performer graph on how return equity would have looked like excluding the REALs. So there's no big secret that the profitability on Rios has been disappointing since the acquisitions back in 2018 and 19. But if I can draw your attention to the difference between return on equity in 2019, you will see that the difference between reported consolidated return on equity and return on equity excluding Rios is four percentage points in Q4 2019. <clears throat> Even more interesting was the underlying development in return on equity for the core segments, with strong improvements for several quarters in a row. Now, unfortunately, the pandemic destroyed that trend, but we strongly believe that we'll get back to the same trend as the situation further normalizes. Axactor also has a clear goal to start paying dividends as the return on equity increases. We also continue to see factors that should push the return on equity in the right direction, and on page 25, we will discuss this a little bit more in detail. As always, we see positive and negative drivers for return on equity. And uh, luckily, the negative factors are of a more short-term nature, while the positive has a more sustainable character. On the positive side, we see vaccination, normalized working conditions for our employees, and normalized debtors' willingness and ability to resolve their debt. We expect increased 3PC volumes and expect lower MPL prices as part of the COVID-19 aftermath. Continued margin expansion uh, as ongoing performance improvement initiatives materialize is expected. We will have reduced fi financing costs and increased investment capacity following the refinancing and the equity uh, raises. And finally, we expect a gradual normalization of the tax rate towards an estimate of 25%. 
On the more challenging side, we see COVID-19 increased pressure on our employees working uh, on home office. We also experienced that the pandemic increases pressure on uh, our debtors' short-term willingness to and ability to, to repay debt. And this element has obviously led to some operational performance issues uh, during last year. So uh, with that, I think it's time to open up for uh, Q&As, uh, Yes, Yes, uh, I'm not sure if, uh, if you guys in Stockholm have any questions on, uh, on the web. Uh, if so, uh, let me know. If not, I'll just, uh, I'll just kick off with, uh, with my questions. I have a few. Um, just give it a few a few seconds here, but uh, yep. I can, I can kick off. Uh, I know this is sort of an open open question, but I think it will be interesting for the audience to hear your thoughts on this. And it's basically uh, your thoughts on how the climate for MPL investments uh, look today versus how it <coughs> has looked, uh, let's say, two to three years ago when the MPL prices peaked in. I think it was early 2018. Yeah, sure, I can do that. Yeah, no, but I think you are completely right. It's uh, I, I share that uh, that view. The the prices peaked in 2018. I think it the prices uh, on portfolios went uh, quite rapidly up from uh, I would say a, a long term industry average uh, for uh, at least the unsecured part uh, has been around plus minus 13. Uh, IRR percent IRR. If you look at the, the say the last uh, 10, 15 years, but then something happened around 20, I would say 2014, as the industry gained more access to uh, capital. So starting to use the the bond market much more actively, uh, um, a lot of uh, capital uh, flowed into the industry, and um, I think that the, that was probably the main reason why the why the prices on portfolio started to uh, to go up, and also probably the sell side became much more professional in, in those same years after the financial uh, crisis. And uh, but I think it it turned in 2018 as we saw that uh, the industry became I would say a little bit more out of favor. The 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 players in the industry has not been able to I would say very few has raised new capital the last few years. It has been. Uh, more about refinancing current debt structure, so the uh, the capacity has not uh, increased, and at the same time the supply part uh, of the value chain has increased as we have seen new regulations coming to the market with the uh, prudential uh, backstop and and uh, and uh, capital weights and so on. So so banks has an incentive to to uh, clean up their balance sheets and this is a, this is a long term trend so a lot of banks have already outsourced their uh, their gpc collection and also are very eager to to sell and at th on top of this you saw especially in the nordics and some european markets that the the consumer banks were increasing quite a lot in scale and they have uh, been very um, i would say uh, very eager to continuously offload their balance sheets so so that is kind of a little bit of a history lesson, maybe Jonas. But uh, but the fact is now that uh, the industry has been a little bit short on on uh, investment capacity and high volumes uh, did come to the market in 18 and 19. But I think what is actually happening right now is that we have an overhang. So there's still 19 batches not sold. Uh, a lot uh, we have, we have seen a new uh, debt piling up on their balance sheets in 2020. And the market has, at the same time, been very, I would say, not not completely frozen or inactive, but very few deals has been uh, has taken place uh, during 2020. We see that this is now changing. I wouldn't say dramatically, but I, we see that um, there are now a climate where it's possible to do deals again. So uh, a few deals has been uh, has taken place, and also we see that the Nordic uh, consumer banks are eager to um, prolong uh, forward flow contracts. Yeah, it's very, uh, very interesting, quite, uh, quite clear and sort of, re sort of related to what you just uh, talked about. Uh, I'm just wondering how, what's your thought on risk reward in the MPL market going forward? Where, where, where do you see in terms of the markets, the best risk reward and also mm -hmm. in terms of uh, asset classes? Uh, yep. uh, MPL secured versus unsecured, uh, etc. 
Yeah. Uh, I think uh, first of all, if you if you start with the unsecured, which is a kind of our specialty, I think it's quite clear that uh, we uh, we believe that the Nordic market is currently the most attractive to invest in, and uh, I think that has to do with the fact that it's not so easy for uh, for other players than the debt collection companies to actually buy debt, at, especially in Norway, where you have a certain set of rules which makes it very difficult for. For investment companies, for example, to buy uh, NPLs, uh, so we see that the competition is less here in the in the Nordics. Um, at the same time, very I think uh, all the Norwegian uh, the Nordic countries has been very robust during the pandemic. So uh, when you uh, like when you ask like the risk reward, I think that it's that has been uh, that the Nordics has uh, is currently the most attractive. But we also see that. Prices are coming substantially down on portfolios in uh, Italy and Spain. Uh, Germany is still a little bit. Uh, yeah, they ha- it hasn't been any deals, uh, or at least no large deals uh, lately. But we believe that all uh, the prices will come down in all our six markets. So on NPL, Nordic's most attractive for us uh, currently. When it comes to the different asset classes, I should be a little bit careful with. Uh, uh, with what I say, because we are not, we uh, we have done a few secured portfolios. What I can say is that it um, we have I mean, we have only done it in Spain, and you you have to be very very good at doing the pricing correctly. And what we have seen is that it's not so suitable for our cash flow profile because often you start with a relatively long legal process where you have a lot of expenses. In legal, yeah, basically in the legal process, uh, which you have to book continuously, and then you have to wait several years, basically, to uh, to settle the the claim. And now, now I'm assuming that uh, you don't get repaid amicable because a lot of these claims are not repaid amicable in the short term. You need to go into a a lengthy legal uh, process, and in in very many cases, you actually end up with the collateral. And this is. This is something that you need to be very care- cautious about because uh, the plan was not to end up with the collateral. And if you do, you need to have a really good evaluation on the collateral. And you don't see the negative effects until you actually have been through the process, ending up with the collateral and actually realizing the collateral. That is when you see the real effect. And that could take years. So that is why we have decided to be very cautious and uh, not invest uh, in uh, secured portfolios, at least not to a broad extent. Thank you. Uh, I guess we have time for at least uh, one uh, one additional question. Uh, I could uh, I could at least ask one here. Um, during 2020, we saw a lot of banks, especially in Southern Europe, uh, introduce uh, debt moratoriums, meaning that they essentially held back on uh, on uh, cases sent <clears throat> to collection, both for third party and uh, and also portfolios uh, for sale. And mm. I'm just curious to uh, what you, you guys have seen uh, so far in in 2021, and uh, what your thoughts are. Uh, going forward in terms of when we can see probably an increased activity level here. Yeah, I think for uh, all practical purposes, the claims are now flowing into the system again. For more, there's still a few banks holding a little bit back, but I would say for all practical purposes, we are back to a normalized situation when it comes to inflow from uh, from the uh, the banks. Uh, and But uh, you have to remember that some of these... Uh, uh, effects are initiated by the government, and some of it initiated by the banks from a more, say, um, reputational point of view. So it's a little bit uh, mixed, uh, but it, it looks now like the the flow is coming back. But it will take time before you will see it through the uh, through the books. And as I mentioned earlier in my presentation, we have seen that it has been it take takes longer time to to sign up new uh, third party clients. Thank you. Um... We have about uh, 30 seconds left here. Uh, mm-hmm. If there are no further, if there are no questions from uh, from the web, I think uh, I think we could uh, wrap up there. So thank you mm-hmm. so much for your time, guys, and uh, thank you to everyone who who listened in to this, uh, watch this presentation, uh, and I wish you all a nice day. Thank you so much, Jonas, and thank you everyone for attending. Bye bye. Cheers.